Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Purcell, and I'm here with best-selling author Derek Landy to talk about his Skullduggery Pleasant series and the last book in the series, The Dying of a Light. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Can I just say that was take eight? It took him that long to actually say those short few sentences. Hello, John. How are you? I'm very well. <laughs> now, thanks for um, revealing my secrets <laughs> to the world. Well, it's can't... your professionalism that I come here for. That's what I just it want is. to make you feel comfortable. Like you're so nice. Yeah. Um, now, I, a lot of authors dream of the moment you had. You were standing in a field and you got a phone call, which pretty much said, Derek, I bought your book. We want to pay you a million bucks for it. Um, now, all of us dream of it, that moment and go, this is going to be the greatest moment of my life. You all but, dream about me in a field? Oh, I dream about you in a field all the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So you, okay. Things. <laughs> right. yeah. I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah. No, the, the idea that, that you get a, a phone call like that and you're suddenly a millionaire from, from a piece of writing you've done mm -hmm. yeah, is extraordinary. Now, in reality, was it as extraordinary as it sounds or was it just a, eh, just an average It was very drab. Very, the reality is no, actually the reality rocks. It's much better than anything you could possibly imagine. Um, no, it's it it, it was it was uh, astonishing. Um, this was this was back in two thousand and six, the very beginning of two thousand six, when I was living at home with my folks, working on the farm, um, you know, being a struggling writer, and then you write one little book uh, from an idea that sparks up out of nowhere. Um, Six months later, your agent sends it off. A week after that, she calls me. Um, she actually called me while I was uh, in the car, and she said, are you sitting down? I said, well, yeah, I'm in the car. She said, I will phone you back. So about 10 minutes later, I got home. Um, we were on the phone. She said, now, are you sitting down? I said, well, no. I, said, I think you should. So, uh, uh, yeah, I it's... It, it, uh, First of all, I was astonished by my re reaction. I was very cool. Like, oh, wow. And my agent was, I know, <laughs> wow. And then we were both, I can't believe I'm taking this so calmly. It's me either. Um, but no, it changed everything. It, it was exactly what you say. It was the, the, the dream. It was the, the, not only the dream that every writer has it's every it's the dream every writer doesn't dare speak aloud because it's so uh, unreasonable it's so far-fetched you don't this does not happen this happens to writers to whom you're reading an interview uh, with you know years later it never happens to you so you might hope you might dream but you know it's not gonna happen but um, it did and it changed absolutely everything um yeah in 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 every conceivable way my life is so much better and um it centered on a, a, a dead guy what is it with you and the dead you did zombie movies or something before yeah you? yeah uh, and and you know before that I, I did like a crime a black comedy crime um so yeah it's it's i think it was because i mean i i i obviously read as a child very you know i mean i taught myself to read with spider-man and batman um and then when i was a kid i was reading the three investigators you know i, I went from the famous five and the secret seven to the three investigators and the hardy boys but we didn't have the range of books that young people have now so uh i went straight you know i think the only ya book or what would be classed as ya now would be The Chocolate War by Robert Cormier yeah. and Beyond The Chocolate War, which are two astonishing books. Um, but we didn't have YA, we didn't have the, the range, the, the types of genres that are available now. So I went straight from Three Investigators and Hardy Boys to Stephen King and Clive Barker and James Herbert. And you know, all the 80s horror uh, icons. How old were you then? When you About 11. Whoa! 11 or 12. You know, and I, I collected the, the series of books called The Executioner, um, and Able Team, and Phoenix Force, all about these, these mercenaries and these vigilantes, and it went into extreme detail about the guns and the caliber, and what happens when this bullet enters 
his brain. You know, it was very, very, um, very grown up stuff. And it was, and I think that, that uh, plus my love of horror movies, my love of, of uh, which has been there since Dracula and Frankenstein as a kid, all of those old Hammer movies and the old Universals. Um, it just has made me the person I am today. You know, and I get to to work. I get to tell the stories in the genres that I love and I've always loved. So you talk about your love of movies now. The jump between um, Scarlet Blackberry Pleasant and the big screen is that going to be taken? Um, hopefully, hopefully. Um, uh, back in two thousand and seven, we we signed on with Warner Brothers. Um, uh, and for a while that was great. I wrote the first script, um, but the way in Hollywood they bring in more writers, the idea is you bring in a writer to a script, they bring in a new perspective or you know they bring in something that's missing. Um, but the reality is obviously a lot different if that were you know if if every writer brought something good to a script, we would have nothing but fantastic movies. Um, but after three years of development and rewriting by uh, three or four other writers, we got what's basically the worst script I'd ever read. Uh, it was diabolically bad. It, there was not one line from the book uh, left, the characters were unrecognizable, the plot was completely different. I don't really mind the plot because you know, if you're going to make a movie, it, you need a different plot. You need to streamline it, you need to amalgamate, you know, so characters do get changed, plots do get changed. Um, but as long as you keep the core, and as long as you're honest about keeping the core, then you're fine. Um, but this was, this was a complete mess. That must be very disappointing. It was. Um, I, I basically got the script in, in you know, the first half of 2010 and I was praying that it would never get made because if it was, first of all, it would be a failure. And second of all, I didn't want a bad Skullduggery movie. I wanted a good Skullduggery movie. So um, uh, pretty much uh, Warners agreed with me. They said, Derek, we've spent millions on all of these writers and we're, we're left with the, the worst script we have in our roster and we have to let it go, you know, we're really sorry. And I, and I said, don't worry about it, don't worry, I'll get the rights, that's fine, thank you. And I went off. And I've been working on it since 2010 with another studio and I wish I could tell you the name of the studio, but we're a few weeks away from announcing the movie deal. We, I signed it about two weeks before coming to over here. Um, so we are, we're about to announce the movie deal. I'm writing the script at the moment. I'm the only writer, and everything is positive. Everything is 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 upbeat and, and it's looking good. But no guarantee it'll ever get made. No guarantee if it does get made, it'll be good. Uh, but if we're lucky. So the the illustrations on the covers, the covers behind you there, are extraordinary. Well, they're yes. just so brilliant. Um, how did they come about? Were they um, a part of like a, all, all publishers all the world got different covers or? Is this look it, just it, it's um, the covers are by a gentleman named Tom Percival, and uh, the reason they're so good is because he's really good, obviously. Uh, as I'm finishing up a book, I will give you know I'll I'll, I'll be talking to him and I'll and I'll tell him what I what I think the cover might be, uh, and then he'll send me a sketch and I'll go. This is excellent. This maybe you need to rethink this so it goes back and forward you know he'd send me sketches and I'd give approval and you know and then he'll go off and he'll come back with something astonishing like the covers um, and the covers are so good and so distinctive that in general all around the world most territories have their own covers uh, but the Skullduggery covers the artwork is just so Wonderful! It's so eye-catching. It's so it's so cool. It's you know so impressive. It's like it's like nothing else out there. Um, so that's been adopted by most uh, countries around the world. But I I'm sent every foreign edition we publish in er, in um, every language, uh, and 
you know, so I have, I have, you know, these covers with uh, different titles, you know, in languages I can't even name. And then you have the covers, you know, the people who didn't go for these covers, who did their own covers. And they, there are some of the most extraordinary covers out there. Like there's this kind of a, like a pop art skullduggery with, uh, it looked like um, it's a, a collage, you know, like one of those old things where, you know, you cut out, a, you, know, you know, the shape of a person and you cut out, you know, like, like the trousers or the jacket with the little hook and you oh, hook yeah, it yeah. in, you know, like the little paper. It looks like that. And I'm going, what? This is, this is selling in Bulgaria? How is that selling in Bulgaria? But it's selling in Bulgaria. And apparently in Bulgaria, a uh, school degree wears red trousers, no shoes, a yellow hat. And, um, yeah, he's, he's just just like garish in the extreme. But um, yeah, the covers we have are just beautiful. Do you have any advice for, say, other vegetable farmers or just any other writers <laughs> on, on how to break into the literary world? Um, pretty much do exactly what I did. Yeah, and hope uh, you get the same result. Um, I don't know, it's so tricky. Um, I mean, being a writer, deciding to be a writer, uh, is is ill advised, you know. But we all know that, you know. I mean, if you're a writer, if you think you're a writer, and yet you hear that being a writer is, is ill advised, and you stop, you're not a writer, you know. So you're going to ignore whatever I say, you know. The practicalities, the realities of being a writer, of trying to get the first book published, and even if you manage that monumental task, the the the. The chances of it, of it being read by anyone is astronomical. The chances of, of it selling any more than, you know, 50 copies is beyond huge. Um, which is not to say you shouldn't try. It's, it's, it's such, it's such a, a hard question to answer simply because uh, reality is a harsh mistress and she will smack you down. Um, but when it works, it works. I mean, I, I had no plan. I, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't follow any particular route. I just, I just, whatever I did worked. I wrote two screenplays. They didn't make me any money, didn't move me out of my parents' house, didn't uh, stop me working on the farm, didn't move me to Hollywood. Um, but they got me an agent. That's what they did. They got me an agent. And... Um, that's the thing that changed everything, you know. So I wouldn't say send your your book to a publisher. I'd say send it to an agent. Uh, the agent will know the publishers. Um, uh, but yeah, it's you know. I mean, I'm I'm I persevered. I had a dream. I was going to be a writer, and I persevered, and I stayed true. And I, I was obstinate, and I was stubborn, and I didn't take no for an answer, and I didn't even begin to fathom the possibility that I might do something else with my life. And I had a dream, and I stuck to the dream. And now that I'm a success, people can go, isn't he great? Isn't he? Look at him. He stuck to his dream, and no matter what happened, he stayed true because he knew, he knew he could make it. And that, that's wonderful. That's marvelous. But the difference between me and a version of me who failed, who didn't have the idea for Skullduggery, because this idea popped into my head, and the difference between me and him is a moment. The moment when that idea came to me. And if something else had happened at that moment, if a car had beeped its horn, if you know, I'd scratched my nose, if a, f a phone had rang, and if I'd been distracted, I would never have had that moment. And so I would now be, the alternative version of me is in Ireland right now, and he's working on a farm right now. He's actually asleep right now, to be honest. But um, he's dreaming about working on a farm. And um, instead of people going, isn't he wonderful for following his dream and never giving up and, and you know, staying true, they're going, oh, look, he's deluded, he's, he's, He's following a false hope, you know. He, he's 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 refusing to face reality. So it's it's a horrible feeling. The fact that 
um, you know, I didn't really work to get, I, mean, I worked to get here, but that idea wasn't work. That idea was inspiration. And that's terrifying. What if something had happened? Yeah. And I never had it, because I, then I wouldn't, I would not be here. Um, I'd probably be a success <laughs> elsewhere, you know. I'd, I'd, I'd obviously. Well, your piano uh, playing is great. Yeah, 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 you know, I could be a, like a pianist or, or one of other people who do stuff. <laughs> Yeah, you know, like a proper job, like a pianist. <laughs> um, thank you very much for talking with us, Derek. My pleasure. All of Derek's books are available on booktopia.com.au right now. <laughs> <laughs>